good day. We're in John Wesley Brady, this freedom whence in the chapter on a nation reborn. He's just been dealing with the, the Clapham sect, so-called, this group of men and women who assembled in that then suburb of London and had an immense impact on the world, and yet most of us don't know their names. Maybe with the exception of Wilberforce, who's had a great deal of publicity in the last 20 years, especially since the movie came out, Amazing Grace, but not enough. So the other names and the wider impact of this group, which its immediate impact was felt, of course, in the in the uh, abolition movement. But we'll get to that in the next chapter. But it, here, Brady's just dealing with the wider impact in in its totality on the generations that followed 1800. He says, if, however, Wilberforce was but characteristic of the Clapham sect, that Christian brotherhood in turn was but characteristic of a new moral earnestness which not only affected the temper of the entire English-speaking world, but spreading through the English tongue and through it, through a purged, invigorated Anglo-Saxon civilization, brought hope and blessing to peoples of many tongues and climes. The evangelical revival, despite the surge of many materialistic forces, was making the gospel a pervasive leaven, not only in the lives of individuals, but in the world of affairs. Like early Christianity, it began chiefly among the outcasts of society. It now was impregnating the lives of men governing nations and leading world-stirring crusades. Even royalty would one day experience its power. Turn first to the realm of poetry. Can anyone half familiar with the teachings and impact of the evangelical movement fail to recognize in the more soulful poems of Cowper and Blake, of Wordsworth and Coleridge, of Browning and Tennyson, of Whittier and Bryant, or of Longfellow and Lowell, the permeating influence of that mighty recreation of soul and conscience? In prose, the impress is not less pronounced. The pages of Anna Moore and Harriet Beecher Stowe of Ruskin and Carlyle, of Irving and Hawthorne, and of Dickens and Thackeray, of Emerson and Stevenson, of Macaulay and Scott, that is Walter Scott, of Henry Drummond and Helen Keller, all hold much to the same purging and nobling source. Some of these authors admittedly were girded when they knew it not, but their common reverence for purity, truth, temperance, justice, and righteousness, individual and social, marks them as men and women whose ideal of life was shaped by the plain, practical Christianity which Wesley had mediated to the multitudes. Their appreciation of spiritual values, moreover, their knowledge of the Bible, their belief in prayer, and above all, their faith in the high destiny of man, separates them by a wide gulf from the shoal of modern realists whose sex obsession, moral cynicism, and spiritual defeatism succeed only in deleting all manliness from man and obscuring all purpose in life. From these emancipated worldlings comes the illuminating verdict that man is a parasite crawling on the vertebrae of the pygmy among the planets. To them and to their set, Wesley and all his followers were fools. Turn next to the immortal social emancipators of modern times, Wilberforce and Clarkson we've already mentioned. Peruse the lives and labors of Lord Shaftesbury, and Abraham Lincoln, of John Howard, and Fowell Buxton, of Elizabeth Fry, and Florence Nightingale, and it becomes evident that the evangelical revival stands to them in the direct relation of cause and effect. Shaftesbury, who constantly described himself as an evangelical of evangelicals when pressing in the House of Commons for the emancipation of women and children from white slavery in the mines, and collieries of Britain, declared, quote, I have been bold enough to undertake this task because I must regard the objects of it as being created, like ourselves, by the same master, redeemed by the same savior, and destined to the same immortality, end of quote. Words of like import might be quoted from every one of these heroic liberators of men. The depth and intensity of their faith made them the doughty emancipators they were. Or the doughty? The doughty. D-O-U-G-H-T-Y. The doughty emancipators they were. 
proceed to other creative crusaders and pioneers in social achievement, and the story is one. Live a while with the careers of Barnardo and Booth, of J.B. Gough and Francis Willard, of Osler and Plimsoll, of Stevens and Loveless, of Toynbee and Jane Addams, of Agnes Weston and Evangeline Booth. And the truth emerges that the source of their vision and efforts was vital Christianity. Radicals would spin plausible social theories and sacerdotalists would argue much concerning sacred symbolism. I think sacerdotalist is the more common pronunciation. That's those who are devoted to the importance of the priesthood. They would argue much concerning sacred symbolism, apostolical succession, and patristic orthodoxy. But the faith of sincere evangelical Christians constrained them to put their hand to the plow and cultivate the vineyard of the Lord. The first article of Dr. Barnardo's will reads, Death and the grave are but temporary bonds. Christ has triumphed over them. I hope to die as I have lived in the humble but assured faith of Jesus Christ, whom I have so imperfectly served, and whom I acknowledge to be my Savior, my Master, and my King. End of quote. Herein is reflected the central inspiration behind the truest tradition of social progress among the English-speaking peoples. These intrepid pioneers, beholding in faith a better country, labored for a society which hath foundations, whose builder is God. Believing themselves surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and enduring as seeing him who is invisible, they sought to save their fellows because they knew themselves saved by Christ. They lived adventurously, gloriously on earth because their abiding citizenship was in heaven. The social fruits of their lives were nourished by the deep roots of their faith. Again, the great 19th century preaching tradition throughout the British Empire and the United States drank deeply from the same fountainhead. Moody and Spurgeon, Beecher and Brooks, Chalmers and Guthrie, Robertson and Dale, Westcott and Ryle, Talmadge and White, Hughes and Jowett, Parker and Cadman, all were powerful expositors of the Bible, which the revival had not only opened to the multitudes, but had made the book of books to the Anglo-Saxon peoples. All two were fired by a passion to mediate Christ, not only as savior of individual men and women, but as savior of the world. Even Newman and Keeble owed more to the evangelical revival than is generally imagined. In his Apologia, Newman pronounces Thomas Scott, author of the famous Evangelical Commentary, the writer who made a deeper impression on my mind than any other, and to whom, humanly speaking, I owe my soul. Of course, Newman had gone over to Roman Catholicism, but acknowledged his spiritual roots. And Hurl Froud, Keeble's disciple, who captured Newman for the Tractarian movement, scented Methodism in his spiritual father's famous book, The Christian Year. Come next to the world missionary efforts of Protestantism. Not only are Coke and Asbury, Carey and Livingston, Moffat and Martin, Morrison and Patton, Johnson of Sierra Leone and Smith of the West Indies, Samuel Zwamer and Mary Slessor inextricably associated with this outpouring of spiritual power, but the whole Protestant world movement with its great succession of foreign missionary societies is a lineal descendant of the evangelical revival or proceed to the pioneers of popular education, and once more the far-reaching impact of this baptism of fire is unmistakable. Hannah Ball and Silas Todd, Whitfield and the American Tenants, Rakes, that is the founder of the Sunday School Movement, and Lancaster, Lucas and Bell, Hogg and Williams, Arnold and Ryerson, Mott and Kagawa are all children of the same spiritual succession confessing constantly the Lordship of Christ. Their educational efforts grew out of their vision of the kingdom of God on earth. Nor even on the stony ground of statecraft and public affairs is this soulful succession quite broken. Pitt and Burke were better men because of the character influences it shed abroad. But consider the lives of Percival and Liverpool, Queen Victoria and the Prince Consort, Gordon and Lawrence, Gladstone and Bright, Keir Hardy and Arthur Henderson, Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt, 
or again of Lloyd George and Mr. Churchill, and it will be found that the influence of that spiritual baptism has been branded deeply upon their lives. It is fatally easy to satirize Queen Victoria's famous message to the African chiefs, quote, England has become great and happy by the knowledge of the true God and Jesus Christ, end of quote. Yet even the partial application of that knowledge is the saving salt of Britain and America in this, the hour of their supreme ordeal. This is written towards the beginning of World War II. Is it not also the cornerstone of freedom in the great self-governing commonwealths of the English-speaking world? Now we enter part three of the book, An Era of Epic Reforms, and chapter 13 starts with the abolition of slavery. I put a link into a, a series Vivian's recently done on slander, how the Watchtower has slandered the churches of Christendom. And the first of those videos was how many of these great missionaries, some of whom were listed here by Brady, how many of these great missionaries did we know as Jehovah's Witnesses? See you next time.